let's take a look at the first question. Does God exist? And we're gonna look at three evidences for his existence. In fact, if you can remember the name of God, G-O-D, you can remember these three arguments. The first one is G, good and evil. Second one in God's name, O, is origins of the universe. And the third, D, is the design of the universe. The first evidence for God's existence is good and evil, or morality. This is a three-step argument that starts like this. Premise one, if God doesn't exist, then objective moral values don't exist. Premise two states that objective moral values do exist, and therefore we can conclude that God exists as well. Objective just simply means it's true whether people believe it or behave by it or not, as opposed to subjective, which means it can change from time to time or place to place. So the question is, does objective moral values exist? I think they do. Just think for a moment. Ask yourself this question. Is it ever permissible morally to torture a baby for pleasure? Obviously the answer is no. It's not ever permissible to torture a baby for pleasure. Subjective moral truths do exist. So now ask yourself the question, what makes it wrong? Well, societies can't make it wrong, and people can't make it wrong, because that would make it subjective, because societies and people change their mind, and that's subjective morality. But we've established that objective moral truths do exist. It's always wrong, everywhere, for everyone, to torture a baby for pleasure. Subjective so moral truths exist. So since people and society can't provide the foundation, for objective moral truths, what is its source? Well, think about it. We have this sense of moral obligation, and obligations don't come from objects or things, they come from persons, from people. Subjective moral truths can't be grounded in societies or people. The only person left over is God. This is a really good argument for God's existence because of the existence of objective moral truths. So let's examine the second evidence for God's existence, the origins of the universe. Sometimes this is called the cosmological argument. It runs like this. Premise one, whatever begins to exist must have a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, we can conclude the universe has a cause. The evidence for the first premise, whatever begins to exist has a cause, is very self-evident. Our universal experience confirms the truth that when things begin to exist, they have a cause. For example, when we hear a knock on the door, what do we do? We examine the cause to find out what it is. Recall back when you were in high school eating lunch and you felt something bounce off the back of your head? Well, what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what you didn't do. You didn't sit there and say to yourself, well, that was an interesting phenomenon that came out of nothing and continued to eat your lunch. What did you do? You turned around and looked for the cause. And of course, when you found the cause, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and you throw your mashed potatoes at that cause. Finally, the evidence for the first premise, whatever begins to exist has a cause, is just much more plausible than its denial. We have no examples of something coming into existence out of nothing. So let's move to the second premise. The universe has a beginning. There's two reasons why we believe the universe has a beginning. The first is the impossibility of an infinite number of past moments. What do I mean by this? Well, first, let's define the word infinite. Infinite means an intraversible set. It means you can't complete it or accomplish it because if you completed it, that's not infinite, that's finite. So think about this. If the universe was infinite, that means you have to cross all of the past to get to the present. Obviously, we've arrived to the present, meaning we've crossed, well, not me personally, I'm not that old, but the universe has crossed all of the past. But to cross it or complete it means it's finite, not infinite. Therefore, it has a beginning. The second reason we know the universe has a beginning, scientific evidence has shown that the universe has a beginning. There is scientific confirmation for the beginning of the universe. 
that is accepted by the scientific community. Now, some might object by asking, well, if everything has a cause, what caused God or who made God? But let me make sure you understand the first premise correctly. It doesn't state everything has a cause. It says everything that has a beginning has a cause. Because God doesn't have a beginning, he doesn't need a cause and no one made him. But the evidence is pointing that the universe does have a beginning and therefore it must have a cause. Now, of course, we have a cause, but can we know anything about the cause? Well, if all time, space, matter, and energy came into existence at the moment of the beginning of the universe, that means the cause of the universe is transcendent or beyond time, space, matter, and energy. Let's think about the implications of the cause of the universe. Think about it. All time, space, matter, and energy came into existence at the moment of the beginning of the universe. That means the cause of the universe is beyond or transcends time, space, matter, and energy. So what we have is a cause that's timeless, spaceless, supernatural, super powerful because it just brought in the universe into existence. And these are just like the attributes of God. The last argument we wanna examine for the evidence for God is design of the universe. Premise one. The fine-tuning for life in the universe is either due to chance or design. Premise two, it's highly improbable it's due to chance. Therefore, we can conclude it's due to design. Let me give an example. Let's say you're walking along the beach and you stump your toe on a rock. You might pick the rock up and look at it, see the way it's formed by the, the rocks and waves and ocean currents upon it and throw it back out into the ocean. But let's say you're walking along that same beach and you pick up a pocket watch. You would never say to yourself as you looked at the pocket watch how the ocean currents and waves and debris formed a perfect working pocket watch. Pocket watches have watch makers. So think about this. Is the universe more complex than that pocket watch or less complex? It's immensely more complex than the pocket watch. And if a simple pocket watch needs a watch maker, then the universe needs a universe maker as well. The existence of life like ours depends on a delicate and complex balance of conditions. There's over a hundred conditions that are necessary for life to exist in our universe. Some of these conditions are so incalculable and incomprehensible, it couldn't have come about through chance. It must have been designed. Some of these conditions are like the electromagnetic force, the gravitational force, the expansion rate of the universe, Take, for example, the placement of our planet in the solar system. If the Earth was fractionally closer or farther from the sun, it either caused all the water to freeze or evaporate. And if you don't have water, you can't have life either. So when you look at these conditions, it shows that the universe that has life like ours could not have come about through chance. It must have been designed, a designer like God. So those are three great arguments using God's name, G-O-D, good and evil, origins of the universe, and design of the universe. Hopefully this is a great starting point for your exploration for the evidence for God's existence.